business would be done at the port of Oshawa and in and among the crown lands at Oshawa. So, in fact, just as the city council has a mandate to make decisions based on uh, the municipal act and the legislation under which it operates, um, the port authorities have a mandate under their letters of patent and the Canada Marine Act to manage, uh, in accordance with those principles, the land uh, at, at the port. So it's, it's um, incumbent upon the Port Authority to hear, to listen to the position that the citizens of Oshawa, and I think one of the speakers has accurately reflected um, uh, some of that position um, in terms of the broader public, but also, of course, to listen to the members of City Council who are elected representatives. And we have done that. No, 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 no. We, What we have not done, and what we are not obliged to do, and in what, in fact, we cannot do, is simply make a decision based on what City Council or some other group decided. We have an obligation as a board to discharge our responsibilities to the best of our ability based on all of the input that we get and all of the facts and all of the analysis and that's exactly what we did. I have every reason to hope certainly that City Council makes its decisions in the same kind of way that they take into account what all of the people say, all of the things they're supposed to take into account, they deliberate and they make their decision and that's the process by which we made the decision, and that's our decision as a port authority to make. That's how we end up. Right, again, ladies and gentlemen, if, if there continue to be outbursts from the same people over and over again, we're going to ask for uh, those people to be removed. So, uh, I, think that, I think that question was answered. Um, so, there have been a couple of questions about the future of ethanol production and the market for it, so I'm going to summarize those into, uh, into one or two questions here. Uh, Dan, maybe you can address these. Uh, someone has written, the United Nations has called for the end of ethanol production from corn, and uh, someone else has written, ethanol production is predicted to be on the decline very soon because corn is needed for food production, so what happens to this plant if that, if that occurs? Well, I think I've already addressed the food versus fuel argument. As I said, we're creating a high quality food at this plant. As for the market in general, as for the market in general, um, the reason that ethanol is in the fuel supply is because it causes gasoline to burn cleaner. In 2006, the, the U.S. government banned a substance called MTBE. MTBE was a product that the oil companies made, a synthetic product that was an oxygen aid. So it caused gasoline to burn cleaner and hotter, thus eliminating some of the smog emissions. What they found, though, was that the, this MTBE poisoned well, well water systems throughout the U.S. So subsequently, they banned it. And in its place, they implemented ethanol as an oxygenate to help the gasoline burn cleaner. It's been proven through tailpipe emissions that it reduces smog by up to 30%, particulate matter, carbon dioxide, etc. That's why we have ethanol in the fuel. Now that there's a mandate in place and a commitment from both the US government and the Canadian government, we have an infrastructure in place to support ethanol uh, movement through through the system. There's all kinds of other alternatives, talks of other alternatives out there, but the reality is we have a, a system in place that can take ethanol and incorporate it directly into the system as it stands today. So the reality is that ethanol is cheaper than gasoline and the oil companies blend ethanol not at the 5% they're required but at the 10% maximum because it's better economics for them. Ethanol in its raw form is 117 octane. It's a better fuel than, than gasoline. 
and it's put in the fuel supply because it boosts the octane of the of the unleaded gasoline. Okay, sir, so we're not we're not taking the questions uh, from the floor, sir. So would you please, sir, would you please sit down? Why don't you respect the other people in the audience, sir? Again, these are these are your questions that I'm, uh, that I'm asking. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen. All right. The next question. Uh, there actually have been several questions about the 17-acre buffer, um, and uh, people are interested to know: Can the length and width of the area uh, be described? Uh, and uh, also a question about um, uh, asking for an explanation of why the port authority concluded that the second marsh is not at risk. So uh, they're looking for the dimensions, I guess, and, and, the, uh, and that question about uh, the conclusion that the second marsh is not at risk. The buffer runs the uh, length of the property that, that Farm Tech has. Um, it's 120 meters wide. Uh, it was, that, that number was come to because that's what the uh, government agencies implement as a safe buffer zone against areas like natural wetlands and etc. So the 120 meters is there for because that's what the government recommends as a necessary buffer zone. All right. And uh, the second part of that question, uh, Gary, which was how you concluded that the, that the second marsh is not at risk. The, um, the environmental assessment was conducted, as we explained, under the guidance. You know, it's really amazing how many people in the room seem to know so much. And actually, and actually have... Mr. Valcor, I don't think that comment is required. <laughs> well, with, with great respect, we haven't been very few comments in any other from you guys that are required either, but we're, we're carrying on anyway. You don't want to allow any comments from us. You have the guts to do it in front of these people. All right. Hey, hey, can you sit down? I'm trying to learn something here. I came out for this tonight. Well, I can't get interrupted. Yeah. All right. The environmental assessment was conducted under the direction of uh, Agriculture Canada and uh, the reason for that was simply because at the time it was commenced um, there was uh, an application by the Farm Tech Operation to access government grants with respect to ethanol production. Um, that process went on for, as we've described, some, I guess, four or more years involved um, many agencies, independent consultancies, uh, the farm tech folks themselves and people that they had to hire to respond to all of the questions that were coming out, all of the concerns that were raised. As I said, the, the city itself, as, as you all know, filed, um, uh, I think, about a 300-page letter. Now, when my reading of it, much of it was um, duplicated, but nonetheless, uh, the uh, people that were responsible for that um, went through that, every one of those objections, item by item, line by line, they responded to all of them, they required farm tech where necessary to make adjustments to its planning, they required, um, as you can see, and we have this uh, 120 meter buffer zone, which is a, a substantial uh, width, there are other safeguards that have been built in um, as part of that buffer zone. So, frankly, looking at all of the, that work that had been done, at the independent reviews that had been conducted of it, at the agencies that had conducted those reviews, frankly, we were satisfied that we were not harming in any substantial way, nor would we in the future be harming anything that had to do with the second we have been as a board authority, and frankly, from 
what I can see from records in the past of the Harbour Commission, tremendous supporter, financially and otherwise, of the second march. And, and I suspect that there are people in this room who, if they were being honest, would admit that that's exactly what's happened in the past. We've been responsible, I think, citizens, with respect to that particular area. We will continue to be responsible citizens, just as farm tech is being a responsible industrial citizen and commercial citizen, and doing all it can in response to any objections that were raised to ensure that there is no harm that will come to the second. Um, I you, hope you made said reference, that sir. Too. Uh, I mean, there were some references uh, that you made to these environmental assessments that were conducted, and a few people have asked the question whether those are publicly available and, and uh, where they can see them. The environmental assessments and the, the final report that was written um, was done, as I've explained, by Agriculture Canada. Agriculture Canada is, uh, I, guess, and, uh, I guess, the owner, if you will, of those. Um, we're very interested in and frankly anxious to have those reports made available to the public. Those requests have gone out. Once again, there's a process that they have to go through. They will have to consult and they are in the process, I understand, of consulting the various agencies and individuals who participated in the conduct of that um, assessment and in the reports that were written with respect to that assessment. And, having, and they now have to go through the process of ensuring that, uh, as this is getting to be released, that all of those agencies sign off on that final report. So that's a process that will take some time. It will happen. It will be available. And uh, my information is that they'll do all they can to speed it up, but they're now looking at, I believe, a timeline that may be into late October or early. Uh, this question asks, uh, what disaster measures have been designed for this new facility, a plant distillery disaster, uh, freshwater contamination, railway lands uh, through residential land? Uh, so what's, what's in place uh, to mitigate against all of that? Uh, at the plant itself, we'll develop an emergency response plan in association with the, uh, the Oshawa Fire Department. We'll have trained first responders at the plant on site. Uh, let's see, we have uh, a 300 millimeter ring main around the site equipped with fire hydrants to provide fire protection. Any of the hydrants will be equipped with features to facilitate the additional addition of special additives used to suppress fires, such as those at other facilities, mainly foam. A minimum of 250,000 U.S. gallon on-site water storage tank for the process and fire water storage. A dedicated fire pump. Fire detection and suppression suppression systems within the buildings. On-site storage of fire suppressants to facilitate first response firefighters. Trained on-site personnel to provide first response to emergency conditions. 